What's going on guys, this is Rob, and this video is sponsored by Omaze, which we'll talk about here in a minute. But a lot of you guys really enjoyed the video that we did where we talked about Kang not getting a whole lot of buildup and how that could potentially be an issue for the MCU in terms of him being like a big overarching villain. And it wasn't really designed to be a griping session, but I'm not really looking to tear the MCU down. Uh, but what I wanted to do here was focus on what I have observed in terms of potentially being another problem in the MCU. And again, really look at this more from things they could be doing as opposed to like the MCU side sucks, right? Like that kind of a thing. So when it comes to the Marvel Cinematic Universe, there is kind of a reason why this is happening. And so I do understand it to a degree. And a lot of it is really based on the fact that like Disney and Marvel have just now gotten the X-Men and Fantastic Four properties, which really includes a lot of this stuff. But now that they have them, there is a massive issue they can correct from the MCU. And this is basically the space opera. Before we get into this, I do wanna talk about Omaze. And again, thank you to them for sponsoring this video. So for those of you guys who have never heard of Omaze, these guys are really, really awesome. What they have here is basically a really sustainable approach to fundraising, which means the various nonprofits that they're fundraising for can in turn focus more on ensuring that those funds go to their communities in a way that benefits them the most as opposed to focusing on fundraising. So what they have going on right now is a campaign where you can enter for a chance to win a Tesla Model X Plaid. I have a Model 3 Performance. I'm probably going to upgrade to a Model X Plaid somewhere along the line, just consolidate both my vehicles into that. But Teslas are amazing. And being able to enter for your chance to win one of these is awesome because your funds are going to support a charitable cause. So the first one of these is Give Power, which is currently on a mission to basically bring two 2.2 billion people around the world access to safely managed drinking water, which is a very much needed thing in the world right now. The second one is 501c3, uh, which really has this mission of bringing the idea of a new type of nonprofit to like younger people, right? It's focused more on energy, food, water, and shelter. And I know a lot of younger people now are far more active than you all were when I was younger. Uh, really nonprofits, charities, things like that weren't as big of a thing back then as they are now. So it was great to see companies like Omaze offering their own innovative take on the idea of charitable causes. So make sure you check the link in the description to enter for your chance to win the Tesla Model X Plaid, as well as supporting Gift Power and 501c3. Again, the URL for that is omaze.com slash geek culture. But let's get back into the video. So right now, the Marvel Cinematic Universe, and a lot of this is built on the fact that like the first 10 years just focused on the threat of Thanos, and that was basically it. Albeit, I would say there were a lot of missed opportunities here. The Marvel Cinematic Universe largely struggles with the same thing that Marvel struggled with, Marvel Comics anyway, for like the first 40 years. And that's the fact that in Marvel Comics from like the 60s running all the way up to like the 2000s, there wasn't really much of a space opera. There was, but there wasn't. It's one of the reasons why stories like Infinity Gone or Infinity War or Infinity Crusade were just like great stories because they gave us this sort of aspect of space that you didn't normally even see. But even like Secret Wars in 1984 was fairly limited. I mean, it was like a bunch of different people, some of whom were from space, but they were fighting on like a makeshift hodgepodge world created by the Beyonder. And then ultimately Dr. Doom stole everybody or stole the Beyonder's power and the story unfolded, blah, 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 yada, yada, yada. The thing about this is that for, for those like 40 or 50 years in Marvel, the idea was that basically you just had characters who would go to space occasionally. And there were some characters who were already in space. Sometimes it was stories about Richard Ryder, who also went by the name Nova, the first version of Nova. Sam Alexander's my favorite. He's just young and he's amazing. I love him as a character. Other times it was like the Silver Surfer, or it might've been uh, Quasar, who at the time was Wendell Vaughn. Although I think right now it's Phi Lavelle. The thing about this is that you basically just saw these stories where it was, they were almost all independent of each other. Sometimes they would cross over, but not very often. Instead, it would be a story about Quasar, or it'd be a story about Silver Surfer, or a story about Nova. Uh, and then you might have things where like Star-Lord's introduced, but the way that he was originally introduced, it was totally wiped clean in the mid 2000s. And the reason why I say that is while you did have, again, these kind of crossover space-based stories, 
All of this changed in the mid 2000s with a guy named Dan Abnett. And he was a writer in Marvel Comics who basically wrote a story called Annihilation. And for like 10 years, this guy literally spearheaded just this huge expansion of the spacefaring escapades in Marvel Comics. And so like the formation of the Guardians of the Galaxy, albeit the one in the movies was actually the one built by Bendis, but uh, the formation of the Guardians of the Galaxies and you know, all that kind of stuff, right? All of that's Dan Abbott. Annihilation, Annihilation Conquest, which for those of you guys who never read comics, Annihilation Conquest is basically a story where Ultron tries to conquer the universe. He possesses Adam Warlock at one point. It had some cool moments. It wasn't as good as Annihilation, but it had some cool moments, right? Things like Thanos Imperative and all that kind of stuff, right? While Dan Abnett didn't write everything, he basically led the charge and planned everything. And it was really, really cool because you got stories like War of Kings and Realm of Kings and different things like that. It was really, really great. But the MCU doesn't necessarily have that. And again, a lot of that is really just predicated on the fact that like the first 10 years were focused on the threat of Thanos gathering the Infinity Stones and the inevitability of what we knew to be the moment where Thanos was going to blink out half the life in the universe. But now that we're done with that, this is a great opportunity to expand on things. And that's why having the Fox properties that were sold uh, by Marvel in like the mid 2000s, or at least the movie rights anyway, uh, in the mid 90s rather, that's why this is such a great thing. Because what this means is a lot of the spacefaring stuff that we could see, could be done by the Fantastic Four, and it wouldn't be overly difficult to do, right? It wouldn't be overly hard to do. All you'd have to do is like reform shield and just say, okay, because of like this giant space god that's basically half emerged from the earth, which nobody really seems to talk about at all, or the fact that Thanos blinked out half the life in the universe or whatever, there's obviously massive threats out there in space. So we need a team on Earth who can go into space and investigate that stuff. And so you get Reed, you get Susan, you get Ben, you get Johnny, they get on some spaceship, they go into space and they're immediately hit by cosmic rays. And they end up, their, their ship goes defunct, they crash land on Earth, and then what do you know? Reed Richards can stretch and Susan Storm can make force fields and make herself invisible and Johnny Storm can set himself on fire and become as hot as the sun and Ben Grimm's just like a walking talking crack rock and that's it right it's just like okay cool like we have the Fantastic Four now awesome right and then like from there it's like let's go back into space and then they just start going and exploring things uh the X-Men bring in the Shi'ar Empire which is cool because right now in the Marvel Cinematic Universe all we have are the Kree and the Scroll. and from the Captain Marvel movie all we know is that they've just been like waging war against each other for a while. And like the scrolls have basically been losing and they are in effect just refugees trying to find like safe havens so they can live and not be wiped out by the by the Kree race themselves. How that translates into the Secret Invasion TV show, I don't entirely know. Maybe it's just one of those things where they're like, hey humanity, uh, thanks for giving us a place to crash. We're gonna conquer your world now, thanks, peace. You know, and that's basically it. I have no idea if that's gonna be the case. In the comics, it was because their world was destroyed. And basically they saw Earth as like the best place to inhabit because the Illuminati were basically screwing with the scrolls. And so because there's, I mean, there's a little more that goes into it than that, but as cool as those races are, they have nothing on the Shi'ar Empire because the Shi'ar Empire, much like the Kree and the scroll, rule like an entire section of the universe, right? Like they rule like a, a, a full on galaxy. The Kree have their galaxy, the, the, the Scrolls have their galaxy, the Badoon, who we've only really seen reference and kind of talked about and seen a few of them in, in like the Guardians of the Galaxy films. We don't really know how far reaching they are, but in the comics, they have their own galaxy. You've got the Dire Wraiths who have their own galaxy. Like there's maybe, there's like seven different races, each of whom rule their own galaxies. And we'll talk about the significance of that here in a second. But the Shi'ar Empire is amazing because where the Scrolls are just like a race, like a singular race, that it expanded out from Skrullos into like the rest of their galaxy and where the Kree are a singular race that it expanded out from the planet Hala into the rest of the galaxy, the Shi'ar Empire is actually an amalgamation of races. That the Shi'ar Empire is led by the main Shi'ar race themselves, which look very similar to birds or they're kind of modeled after birds to a degree. They're more avian than they are like traditional human. But in effect, what they do is they travel around from like world to world and they conquer it. And then they bring it into the service of the Shi'ar Empire as a whole. And the reason why they do this is because it's basically a smarter deal, right? It's a smarter thing to do because there are more technologically advanced races out there, right? So it's better to have an empire composed of a bunch of different races than have an empire composed of a singular race. And so what this did is it also brought in something called the Imperial Guard. And the Imperial Guard is legit. I'll tell you right now, 
even if they bring the Imperial Guard in and they like nerf them down, right? They reduce them down in terms of like power and danger from the comics to the MCU. There's still no team that's been introduced in the Marvel Cinematic Universe that could go toe to toe with the Shi'ar Imperial Guard. We're of course leaving out obvious, you know, obvious things like Doctor Strange or like Scarlet Witch or something like that. But like the traditional Avengers team, so like Thor, Incredible Hulk, Iron Man, Captain America, Black Widow, Hawkeye, they would get absolutely destroyed by the Imperial Guard and probably just by Gladiator himself, right? Gladiator is what's called a Strontian, that's his race. He's basically an allegory for Superman. And in fact, he was modeled off of Superboy when he was originally created. This guy is a beast, right? This guy took on Juggernaut by himself. Like the guy's an absolute hoss, right? He is enough to be able to take on Thor and the Incredible Hulk. How long that fight between himself and the Incredible Hulk would go on, I don't fully know because the Incredible Hulk has infinite strength and Gladiator does not. But the point that I'm making here is this guy by himself is an absolute monster. You add in the rest of the Imperial Guard and almost nobody would stand a chance. They could take out Thanos, right? Now, from there, you start moving into teams like the Annihilators, right? The Annihilators were a crazy powerful team. Silver Surfer, Beta Ray Bill, who for those of you guys who don't know, Beta Ray Bill was the first person in Marvel Comics to be able to lift the hammer of Thor. And he's basically been a massive ally of Thor ever since. He's crazy powerful like he's just an amazing character um let's see it had uh wendell vaughn's quasar and then like ron and the accuser i mean literally this team is powerful enough to take on all comers the only people who would be able to overcome the annihilators this is legitimately speaking the only people who would be able to overcome the annihilators would be obvious trump cards like thanos with the infinity gauntlet and the upper level cosmic entities but like galactus he would fall before the power of the annihilators largely because of silver surfer and his his abilities with the power cosmic because all he has to do is just channel that power cosmic and everybody else sure i guess galactus could take it away from him but he never does, right? So just based on that, like the Annihilators are a ridiculously dangerous team. And that's just to name a few, right? On top of that, then you have like just individual characters that would be really, really interesting. Philovel's Quasar, the idea of like the quantum bands, the Nega bands look like what uh, Miss Marvel has in the Miss Marvel TV show that's coming up. Whether or not that's actually true, I'm not really sure. But as soon as I saw that, I was like, those look like Nega bands to me, right? It looks like what's happening there is all these different forms of technology, right? Like Shang-Chi's 10 rings and all that kind of stuff. Like it, you, you could argue, and to me, it looked like stuff that belonged to the Inhumans. The biggest, the bigger issue you have to contend with there is like, according to like the post credit scene of, of Shang-Chi, there's nothing there, at least as far as that technology that's recognizable, uh, especially when it comes to like spacefaring stuff. Unless of course, with Captain Marvel being a member of the Kree and the Kree being a group that initially created the Inhumans, if records of all of that stuff was expunged. So basically she doesn't know they exist because as far as the Kree race is concerned, all the history was erased. So there's nothing for her to compare it against. So that's entirely possible, right? I mean, we know from all the comics, the Kree were the ones who created the Inhumans in the first place, right? They were just considered a failed project and all evidence of the of the Inhumans were erased by the Kree Supreme Intelligence. So there's, a, there's that possibility there. But the point that I'm making is that whenever it comes, when it comes to the spacefaring escapades, Adam, warlock and people like that there's so much you can do there and so i don't know about you guys but i will say that that ever since the ending of avengers endgame right um a lot of what we've gotten so far seems to be just kind of interim content like i love spider-man no way home it was great and it was amazing to find out it was basically the the third movie in an origin trilogy uh, trilogy for tom holland's spider-man i loved that and i'm really really looking forward to doctor strange 2 and i love to see what comes out of like the loki tv show the falcon and winter soldier was cool i guess and like you know and and like the other shows that we're getting right largely kind of just seem to be filler content until we get to like the next big thing right which hopefully we, we end up getting which may or may not be kang but what i'm saying is that that while i wouldn't argue the mcu is growing stale at the moment i would argue it's only a matter of time before it does if this isn't necessarily something that they feed into that they tap into that they kind of give us uh, exposure to with like the various gods that exist out there thor love and thunder may very well give us that because gore the god butcher traveled around the universe killing every god he could find on every planet everywhere i mean the it was it was nuts like literally him and like the all black necro sword it was just him killing everything and so this is a great potential or a great chance or opportunity 
for the Marvel Cinematic Universe, even if it's only in cameos, to give us other things that exist out there, right? Say for example, and this, this is something to keep in mind, if over the course of Thor Love and Thunder, you end up having a moment where they reference the fact that Gore the God Butcher had killed Shara and Keithri, those two names right there, those are the gods of the Shi'ar Empire. The Shi'ar Empire exists in the MCU, right? Just like that. If Gore the God Butcher killed Klibin and Slagurt, those are the gods of the scroll race. I know their names sound weird, but like those are the gods of the scroll race, right? So it's like, okay, cool. Like that's how they're building up, right? How they're building up and they're expanding on those things. So again, not really a griping session here. It's just something I've observed. There's a lot of potential in focusing on, or at least bringing in spacefaring escapades into the Marvel Cinematic Universe. It's only a matter of how they do it, but it would be great to see. Again, a lot of the stuff that was done here, the Annihilator specifically was based on previous knowledge of characters who already existed. Ron and the Accuser's dead, so there's no way he'd be part of the Annihilators. Silver Surfer has not been introduced yet. Adam Warlock exists. We simply just haven't seen him yet. Last we saw, he was in a, in a cocoon, right? And that's basically it. He presumably emerged somewhere along the line, and if not, will probably emerge in uh, Guardians 3 or Thor 4 or somewhere along those. I still say those are two sides of the same movie, right? Like Infinity War and Avengers Endgame, that those movies will basically, in some form or fashion, support each other. Like, Adam Warlock will likely appear in both. I don't know if that's the case or not. Uh, but, you know, a lot of those characters like Beta Ray Bill, we saw like a statue of his head on like Sakaar. People are saying that's the case. He's a Corbinite but he's also a unique looking Corbinite. So again, maybe maybe that was him, maybe that wasn't him, I don't know. But the important thing here is that a lot of these characters that will that could be a part of the greater MCU as far as spacefaring escapades haven't necessarily been introduced yet. But I have to believe this is part of the plan. And if it's not, that presents a huge problem. So let me know what you guys think down in the comments section, right? Do you want to see more spacefaring stuff? And, and is the stuff on Earth kind of growing a little stale. And if we do, where do you think we'll see the greatest expansion of, of space-based content in the MCU? Do you think it's Guardians 3? Do you think it's Eternals 2, which will hopefully be both a love letter and an apology for Eternals 1? Do you think that it'll be in Thor Love and Thunder? Where do you think we'll see a lot of this stuff at? With that being said, guys, we're going to bring this to an end. Again, thank you to Omaze for sponsoring this video. Make sure you guys check the link to the Omaze campaign down in the description, and I will catch you all later. Peace.